everybody! This is Brandy, and today I'm making a video called DID Behind the Scenes. And today's video is going to be about what it's like to have DID on a day-in, day-out basis. What you see here in my videos is a sort of distanced portrayal of the disorder because I want people to see me and relate. I want them to think, this is a normal girl and she's got normal everything. Normalcy is very important. It used to be very important to me. It's still important to me. And I don't know why, because the only truth I know is that normalcy does not exist. Normal is a myth. Nobody's normal. There are people who are better at acting normal than others, and there are people who don't have disorders, so I guess that could fall into the normal category. But when I started to realize I had this disorder four or five months ago, very recently in terms of DID, this is a an extreme lifelong struggle that's very difficult to cope with on a daily basis. The main factor, DID, is so much more difficult than a lot of other disorders in general, psychiatric disorders or just disorders generally, is the uncertainty. If I had any other disorder, if I had anxiety or depression or mania or not to discount the severity of any of those disorders because they can be incapacitatingly bad. My mother suffers from one of those illnesses and she's pretty far along on the spectrum when it comes to the difficulty of her disorder and how it has impacted her life. So I do not want to take anything away from those very, very serious disorders, but there is just one difference between them and DID. They can remember I can do things that I don't remember. I can do things that are really out of character for me. And I've dealt with that my whole life where people would look at me like I'm some sort of circus freak because one minute they would have a conversation with me, particularly doctors in the mental health profession, and I would be perfectly articulate, insightful, know exactly what's going on, not have any of those behaviors that doctors found difficult, like self-harm or suicide attempts. And I could talk to them and we could converse, we could just discuss it, we could, you know, everything. And then maybe the next day I would do something extreme, like take a screw out of a bed at an acute care facility just to show them that I got the screw out of the bed. You're not supposed to get screws out of bed because that can be a weapon. So just to be aware, if you ever go into a psych unit, an acute care facility, don't pull screws out of beds. Not a great idea. <laughs> you might end up on a one-to-one -one or you just don't know what will happen. But that's not the kind of thing I do. I'm not gonna pull a screw out of a bed. I'm not gonna do certain behaviors, but my alters will. I have alters that love, they are mischievous, they like to wreak havoc, some of them. Some of them are calm and soothing and helpful to me. That's because, you know, these are different ego states. These are different drives and they have different purposes. My job is to unravel their purposes so I understand what they're actually doing and not just what I think they're doing. Because a lot of stuff that is that happens within a DID system is symbolic. It follows dream logic and metaphor and imagery and you don't often get like a direct message like, I want you to do this, <laughs> I want you to do this. Sometimes you do, like sometimes I get a message from an alter who wants a specific thing, but often their communication comes in forms of like feelings, passive influence, or they take over, which I learned is the overt form of DID. Um, not the covert form. 94% of people with DID suffer from an, a covert form of DID. Basically that just means that they hear their alters in their head. They don't often have to act out the communication. 
because the communication happens inside the head. Now that doesn't mean they're not being, they're not influencing the person. I'm sorry, my cat is right here and she's just being a maniac. So people with covert DID can be absolutely passively influenced. They can switch, they can do all of that stuff, but it'll be a lot less noticeable. And that is because it's for survival reasons. Everybody who has DID has it for a different reason or set of reasons, and it is designed perfectly to that set of reasons. So in my case, I had to be overt. Honestly, I don't really know why. I will say, I will make an assumption. I will assume it's because my mother was severely mentally ill and other, I had a lot of other situations where I had to be extremely attuned to changes in people. And I had to be able to change with them in order to survive. And so my mother could have been in a very motherly loving state, in which case I had to have a part that could accept that love that could love a mother who was ill. And I do love her. It was absolutely not her fault. She was mentally ill. I don't blame her at all. Um, and I, I'm so sorry I lost track of what I was saying, which is common when you have DID um, because it is a form of dissociation. So I do tend to lose my train of thought. Doesn't mean I won't get it back. <laughs> um, I know I was talking about my mother and the reasons I had to have an overt form of DID, which means that my alters tend to act out with the body their messages to me and the things that the body needs. Um, whereas covert, they tend not to do that as much. It more happens in the head, the thinking, the way that they communicate. Yes, and with my mother, I had to act extremely different at different times. She was extremely unpredictable because of her illness. And so, yes, I had to be able to adapt quickly. And sometimes those drives of love and fear conflict. And that's what splits a small child apart. You have a protector. I'm sorry, that's my cat scratching the litter box. And he has a serious OCD issue with the litter box. He scratches like everything, everything for like 25 minutes. So I apologize. I'm sorry, I don't remember what I was saying. But anyway, I have the overt form of DID. And today I really wanted to show you guys a little bit of what my week is like when certain alters surface. I kind of want to show you a montage or clips of things that happened in the past 10, you know, eight to 10 days. So you can see that this person, this put together person you see here on your camera, this is the person that I am. I'm all of this, but I am not always this put together because the disorder is extremely difficult. It's an extremely scary disorder. And anybody who would consider role-playing this disorder, romanticizing this disorder, or sensationalizing this disorder, does not understand the nature of this disorder because the suffering it causes is immense. For most of my life, I felt I was basically a rat in a funhouse maze. Um, doctors watched me act out my DID, but never told me. They never told me that, you know, they thought I had DID. They, they would say it occasionally, like, okay. I learned, but it was way late when I learned. And sometimes I look back on that time and I'm angry about it. I'm like, why did they let me do all of this? Scramble around like with chicken with her head cut off, trying to figure out the mystery, what was wrong? Why couldn't I finish my schoolwork? Why couldn't I do this? Why do I behave this way sometimes and this way? So I did awful, some stuff I did appalled me to my core, but I couldn't stop it. And that's basically the major problem with this disorder. I know I've mentioned it before, but like I said before, you don't get to choose when, where, and who you change, switch in front of. It can happen at any time, and that's why it's so scary. Anybody who would romanticize DID does not probably have it, um, because the amnesia combined with the changes in personality is something you have to confront on an minute to minute, hourly, daily basis. You, there's not a day you can wake up and be like, well, I'm gonna just have this day. I'm gonna wake up, do this and this and this and this and this. You can do that, you can plan it. 
but it doesn't mean it's gonna happen. I could plan 10 things to do in a day, and halfway through that day, two hours through that day, who knows? I could be triggered and I could switch, and that could send me in a different direction for a week or two, a day, a month, I don't know, I don't, not a month. I don't think it's ever happened for a month. Um, but then again, I have a lot of amnesia. And so, who knows what's happened. I've had a very, I guess, interesting life, but I don't think it's the type of interesting an average person would want for themselves. A life with out of control DID, which it was for me because I didn't know I had it, is a life of absolute confusion and chaos, sometimes. Sometimes I made it work, but it was a huge struggle. And when you don't know what you're struggling against, it is almost impossible to achieve what you need to achieve in that struggle. I do see a lot of teenagers, you know, romantically portraying this disorder, wishing they had it, calling themselves preferred identities, like pre plural preferred identities and stuff like that. And a lot of people with TID, if you asked them, would say, no, I, I wish I didn't have these preferred selected identities. They would, they would wish they could be whole. Because I think all the time about how I could achieve so much if I had access to everything I knew all at once. That's what it would be like if my amnesic barriers came down. And that would be amazing. I mean, who knows? I'm, I don't know where I'd be right now if I didn't have the amnesia barriers I have. And that's usually what's missing in factitious DID or people who roleplay DID is the amnesia, the scary part of the disorder is missing. So yes, you may act differently. You may wanna wear different clothes sometimes, but let me just say you don't go out and wear different clothes. I don't go out and dress like 20 different altars, every, you know, regularly. I try to dress in a, a, a cohesive way so that people who know me don't think I'm crazy. I really can't express to you enough the suffering that comes with DID. And part of the reason I make videos like this, part of the reason I draw pretty pictures and edit as best I can, is A, to distance myself from my disorder, and B, to show the world that I'm capable, that despite all of this, I'm capable. I just don't have the bravery to bring my raw self to the camera. And that's why I'm doing it this way. That's why I'm just sort of introducing it. I'm gonna show you some clips that have happened throughout the week. And they're not all pleasant. I'm gonna put trigger warnings here. There's going to be imagery of self-harm. There's going to be crying and flashbacks. There's going to be a little humor in the mischievousness of one of my alters. And so it's just sort of how um, a week with DID can be a week of extremes. But it doesn't mean it has to be, and it, not, and, and it isn't always, and usually they're not too long, maybe a few hours, although I've had a few days recently in which I've had parts take over for almost the entire day, two days in a row. That's one of the reasons my video's late. But I just want people to know that it's not all makeup and hair and fun role-playing dress-up. There is a lot of work that comes with this disorder. If you want to achieve anything in your life, I guess I could just fall back and let it take me and then end up wherever I end up, but I just don't have that in me. I want to achieve. I want to do what everybody does. Here are some of the clips of things that happened to me over the last eight to 10 days. So you can see some of the struggle behind the glossy little videos that I make to feel better about myself, to feel more sane, to feel like, yeah, I have all these extremes and all this bad stuff, but at least I can edit a video beautifully. At least I can make something to communicate with the people who are in my situation. I don't want anybody to ever feel the way I felt. I don't want anybody to ever feel like a rat in a funhouse maze where you just don't even know what you're looking at. And no matter how smart you are, no matter 
what your goals are, how, what your drive is, no matter your motivation and your anything. You can't will a different person to do what you want. You can't wish it into existence. And that's what I was doing. I was fighting to be me, but I didn't know it. And now that I know that I'm we, maybe I can begin to build the life I'd always wanted to build. Instead of shutting down every part of me out of fear that society would not accept me. And for any counselors or doctors in training, I know you look at some of these videos, videos of altars and think, well, that's ridiculous and you just dismiss it out of hand. I would really suggest you don't do that. Because yes, did the Sphinx look very different from me? Did she maybe, in your opinion, look silly? Maybe she did. But she's a part of me. She's not a part that surfaces often. She doesn't take over the body very often. But she's the overseer of my whole world, and I appreciate and love her for that. And if she wants to make a video, however she wants to dress, in the, whatever style she wants, with whatever music she wants, she gets to. Because I spent 42 years putting her in prison with all the other altars, and you'll hear about it because they, you know, they make videos for me and endlessly talk about the prison I put them in and how it hurt them. And so yes, if my altars want to make their videos a certain way, they're going to make them that way because it's for my own well-being. It's for our well-being. It makes them feel better, which on a whole makes the entire body feel better. Now in the past, I might not have sought that out. I might have chosen cutting instead, suicide attempts instead. So making these videos is the healthiest thing I know how to do. It's the way I know how to cope with this new, new old <laughs> and scary, scary experience of trying to learn who you are after 42 years of confusion and not understanding your whole behavior. So I just wanted that to be clear. And so trigger warning, there's traumatic stuff ahead. There might be imagery you shouldn't see related to scars and self-harm. And like I said before, there's flashbacks and crying and things like that. So you may want to cut the video off right here if you have trauma so you don't have to worry about those things. And um, thank you guys so much for watching my video. It means so much to me. And all the people who've subscribed, you are incredible. And you are helping someone who has not had it easy in life or in the mental health care system. And why? I will say it all comes down to stigma. Now that's where I'm gonna, it's just all comes down to stigma, so. So thank you. And here, here I, we are. Okay, um, what, what, where do you live? I don't know, I live in a dark place. Oh, would you like some light? I don't know. Um, any, um, food, candies, snacks, or... I, what? No, I don't know. It's okay. Don't cry. <laughs> What's wrong? Please don't play games with this. We we don't have time to waste all this time. Seriously, like, please. We are already a day late on our video. So, are you good with that? She won't, like, answer me in words, but I feel like her calm down, that, that hospital feeling she gives me, it's like, help, she's gonna calm down a little bit. So I guess, I guess that, maybe that's an agreement, you think? James has to do something. She feels that we have to have some fun in order to protect the body. 
to release, I guess, certain neurotransmitters and endorphins to help with the fight. Sometimes she does negative things to get us there, and we're trying to prevent that, okay? Because we used to have an issue with cutting, okay? And it was a bad issue. It wasn't like some simple, like, a few little scratches here or there. Uh, I almost had to have my left arm amputated beneath the elbow because of the severity of our cutting. And James does that for protective reasons that I don't quite understand yet. I had, at one time, I had at one single time, 200 stitches and 11 staples in this arm all the way up to here because of the severity of the cutting. And that also landed me in the state hospital, a place I should never have been and should never go again. I do not belong there. Um, we were not psychotic. I just had a disorder that I did not understand. <laughs> I didn't know at the time that I had DID. I just thought I did these things that I couldn't quite control, and if I tried harder, I'd be able to control it, if I just tried hard enough. But I didn't understand that there is no trying hard enough when another person is doing something. You old. You an old bitch, bitch. You old. <laughs> like, I like Eminem's hair. Multiplicity me, I like her hair. It's like really punk, it's sort of like, Bangs, layered, punky. And I would cut the hair. I would. If I get a chance. Because we were in cells. We were jail cells. We were in jail cells away from each other. And that made us sad. And Like, we have a really pretty inner world. But, like, we can't always go there. Because sometimes Brandy puts us in jail. And when she grabs onto the body and she won't let go... She puts us in jail, and it hurts, and we're scared. And we don't want to be in jail. It's gonna be okay. What would you like? <laughs> we want the toys that they're gonna give. So we can all play. Okay. Be able to... I want to play with them too. Oh, okay. Is that you, Brandy? I don't know. I don't know. I just feel very floaty. I'm glad you were sitting down. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. <sighs> what was that? What happened? My lips are numb. It's like, she's so afraid we're gonna be dangerous. We're gonna go out and run into the street like a bunch of idiots. We're not stupid. We're not crazy, Brandy. We're not gonna run into the fucking, fucking street like a bunch of idiots. And I know Brandy's afraid of us coming out at all. Like, she's so scared. <laughs> I don't even know if this is normal for people with DID, but it's just, this bitch is scared, scared, scared.